We have a carload of tulips in our studio today, courtesy our friends Salvi and Tom on Liberty Avenue. But the fellow who normally tiptoes through them is nowhere in sight. You know, I have a tendency to want to laugh, though really it's no laughing matter. It's no laughing matter as to why Tiny Tim isn't in our contact studio this morning as we had announced that he would be. And uh, I, I thought that you certainly deserve an explanation this morning. When we first heard that Tiny Tim was coming to Pittsburgh to appear at the Holiday House, naturally we, we wanted to uh, book him for the contact show and we went through the, the normal channels that we do with people who appear at the Holiday House. We arranged it through the public relations director there. And uh, it was all set, we thought. Last Sunday, Tiny Tim arrived from Australia and gave a performance at the Holiday House. We went because there was to be a press reception afterwards, and I personally spoke with Tiny Tim while he was sitting next to his wife, Miss Vicky, and he promised me that he would be on contact this morning. And while he was promising us that he would be on contact, there was a secondary member of his managerial staff who was rather agitated and kept saying that uh, Tiny Tim would not appear on any TV or radio programs in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, his reason being that Tiny Tim was very tired, and uh, again, Tiny Tim said he wasn't so tired that he couldn't do the, the contact show or other programs. Well, we've commented more than once that it's amazing how success makes people very tired. Well, remembering what he did say, of course, that um, he would appear on the contact show, we tried to reach Tiny Tim by phone yesterday. We even sent him a wire, a telegram, and uh, just to remind him that we were expecting him, and the calls and the telegram were diverted to this secondary member of his managerial staff. And, uh, well, he's not here. He said he would not be here. The, this uh, member of his staff said he wouldn't, even though Tiny Tim keeps saying that he would be here this morning. And it's, uh, well, we feel very badly about it. The last time this sort of thing happened involved the, the president of the Mattachine Society, who just didn't show up. That's a society, as you know, for, the, for homosexuals throughout the, the country. But uh, when a man doesn't keep his word, you know, it's a very, very unprofessional thing. Uh, not a very nice thing, and in this case, we feel a, an insult to the people of Pittsburgh. Since we don't have a live guest in our studio this morning, we beg your indulgence, and we're going to turn the hour over to a, a rerun with a gentleman, a gentleman named Senator Eugene McCarthy. He was a teacher, congressman, and political Pied Piper of sorts. He is a senator and poet. You're invited to spend the next hour with Senator Eugene McCarthy of Minnesota. Today is Tuesday, March 24th, and this morning, contact... KDKA Contact, live television at its best. I can't imagine of a nicer way to begin the contact program this morning, and you may talk with John Gary by calling 333-9200. Uh, your experience, Miss Vincennes. My experience? Yeah. Just as a homosexual person? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When did you discover it, and, and, and how did well, it Well, I've had been attracted to women ever since I was very little, which means I had crushes on older women. But which many girls... Why older women? Why not women your own age? Well, when I was six. Oh, <laughs> six. <laughs> she said when she was a little girl. <laughs> but I mean, say, as far as a, a seven or eight or nine-year-old child was concerned, I mean, you didn't have the same feeling as did toward an older woman. 
oh, I kept having crushes toward older women when I was a teenager. Even though this continued, I was also dating boys. And for, uh, for a while, I really tried to uh, become, be like everyone else. And then it was not till my middle uh, 20s that I had my first homosexual love affair. It finally broke through, and ever since, I've stopped trying to adapt to the average way, which is heterosexuality. Yes, spring has arrived in our town at long last, and to celebrate, Contact has moved outdoors in Gateway Plaza to commemorate spring in a very special way. Join us for what we hope will be a most refreshing hour. When spring comes to Pittsburgh, sometime in May, it's time to start planning your beautiful wedding day. Hi. as a woman who has enjoyed a liberated status for a long time, do you feel the women's liberation movement is valid? Well, I suppose it is for women who uh, simply want equal pay for equal work. I think that certainly is. But some of the women are a little scary. I mean, they're so militant and so... Uh, mm. Well, I think it's a shame when Avon ladies have to travel in pairs. <laughs> How are things going at the fair? Oh, it's been delightful out there. Everybody's having a ball. We are doing so many shows. Let's take a phone call. Hello? Hi, this is Marie Tory. Who is this? Marie Tory. Who do you think it is? Dagmar? Well, who do you think it is? I don't know who's talking. Well, you tell me who's talking. Is it a man I know? Well, it's certainly uh, broad, you know. <laughs> very funny, very funny. That I can't use. What? Are you talking Don't to Don't worry, you'll use it, Burl. Let's hear it. What's your question, my friend? Well, if I told you it's a great one, what would you say? Uh, we are just only an hour show. What is the question? I told you, if I told you it was the great one on the phone, what would you say? It's Gleason. That's it, right. Is this Jackie? Oh, that's the surprise. Oh, hello, Jack. Let's hear it for Gleason. That's him. I didn't know that was you. Why, you fool? In the first place, um, there are plenty of other ways of conducting um, a, a farewell to a person besides having a funeral and the viewing and the beautiful memory picture and all of that. One, one way, which is much preferred by many, is to have a memorial service without the body present. That is to say, the friends and the neighbors gather, 
a clergyman if they happen to be religious. If not, it can be a secular sort of thing, you know. You would never, where you you would never uh, do anything with, with the body, in other words? No, you, you, the body is not there. You, you mm -hmm. gather, mm -hmm. you, you talk about what the person's life meant, which is the important part. Now, um, of course, Mr. Rather th thinks that that drives people off their rocker to not see the body, because the grief therapy, according to his psychiatrists, you see, is, um, prevents insanity by this. In fact, but there's another reason behind all this, because at one of your closed meetings, Mr. Rather, one of the industry meetings, you said some years ago, discussing these memorial services, a phrase which I've always remembered, and which I think I quoted in my book, without a body, there is no funeral. Without a funeral, there'll be no funeral directors. A word to the wise should be sufficient. In other words, the financial loss to the funeral industry of quietly disposing of the body, by cremation possibly, you know, and holding this kind of family gathering or reunion to, uh, to uh, memorialize the life of the person is very much frowned on by you, isn't it? Because without a body, there will be no funeral. Without well, a funeral, that, there will be uh, no funeral industry. As is so often the case, Ms. Mitford, you've taken that out of context. Let's at, hear at, the context. Well, at no time have I ever said anything solely for the benefit of funeral directors. I am sure that the funeral has values. The funeral hasn't been around all these years because of funeral directors. They didn't invent it. It's been around. And the body is essential to a funeral for many people, even so far as the material if, if do, do we really know Mr. Rather? Do we, maybe yes, we, we, do we do really know. haven't we done do Mr. Rather. We, we haven't done it differently. We way. explored this matter. We, we have now, let, let, us, let us say that there have been three forms of alternate types of funerals proposed. Other groups have come into it. Consumer cooperatives have gone into funeral service. Mm -hmm. There are very few of them around today. Unions have gone into funeral service. There are very few union funeral homes left today. Memorial societies have been in existence since, oh, 1950 or so. There's one in Pittsburgh. It's been much publicized. You can get all the literature on it you want. KDKA-TV, Pittsburgh. Just one moment now, KDKA, in cooperation with the Pittsburgh Post and Sun, will present the latest presidential election return. It is now apparent that the Republican ticket of Harding and Coolidge is running well ahead of Cox and Roosevelt. At the present time, Harding has collected more than 16 million votes against some 9 million for the Democrats. We'll give you the state vote in just a moment. But first, we'd like to ask you to let us know if this broadcast is reaching you. Please drop us a card, address station KDKA, Westinghouse, East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The time is November 2nd, 1920. The event, the Harding Cox election. The audience is a select one. Those assembled near loudspeakers at Pittsburgh's Edgewood Club and a handful of pioneers who had crystal sets in their homes. Today, we commemorate that first broadcast on that first radio station of 50 years ago. We honor that station and those people for what they were and for what they became. I'm Marie Torrey, and this is Contact. This special edition of Contact, celebrating the golden anniversary of KDKA Radio and the broadcasting industry, is being presented live on KDKA AM, FM, and television. And now, here's Marie Torrey. Since we're making so much about the people who were involved with radio 50 years ago, we thought that you might be interested in seeing some of the history of Ed Chauncey. This is a surprise to you, Ed. You didn't expect this, did you? Well, look no. at yourself there. Who's that? <laughs> oh, my. There's my old friend, Rainbow. Who's that? Elmer Waltman was his right name. He was with us for all so many years, over 15 years from the late 30s through 1954. And Rainbow and I were on in the morning from 7 to 8 for many a happy broadcast. And uh, for the benefit of those listening on the radios and don't have the television sets on, they're showing some old slides of Rainbow and myself. And there he is preparing breakfast for us, you see. I was sponsored by one of our food outfits. There's that old fat Chauncey, looks like the moon coming over the microphone <laughs> with a dairy hat on for one of our uh, dairy companies here in Pittsburgh. 
I look like Paul Whiteman. People used to say, in fact, they used to call me Paul Whiteman quite frequently. But then we had a picture taken side by side one time, and we different. didn't look nearly as much alike as everybody thought we did. <laughs> <laughs> this is Ed today. You know, people say uh, you haven't changed a bit, but my goodness, you should see some of those first ones. <laughs> well, you've changed. You've changed very gracefully, really. I say some of the. Why well, you're kind? No, you really have. I say some of those shots of me way back in the old days when we used to go down and get our picture taken was B.C. before chins. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, you know, there are many, many famous graduates um, of KDK Radio, and uh, some of them had their share of bloopers. You know, there, there are times when all of us who are involved in broadcasting will, will have to put up with something that has gone wrong, something will make us laugh, perhaps, sure. or something will make us nervous. And uh, we wanted to, to uh, bring up one of the most famous of, of bloopers, if, we'll, uh, if you'll just bear with us a moment. You'll hear, and I'm sure you'll recognize this, this voice. Well, let, let's hear it now. Well, all of Sal is always the thing you were up. Tell Harris, the band leader, uh, she explains that working so hard all day in the film studio, she is sometimes not in such perfectly good humor. <laughs> and she, she snaps at me. <laughs> Which is all wrong. <laughs> to which I say, you're all for hours. <laughs> now Lowell Thomas says, so long until tomorrow. This <laughs> program came to you from New York. We have Lowell Thomas on the phone, and um, I'd love to ask him about, the, about this particular situation. Lowell? Hello, Marie. Hi. Before we talk about me, I'd like to talk about you. Oh. The only thing I have against KDKA is that we don't have you in New York anymore, and you know, the newspaper world fell apart after you left. I hope you're enjoying our party this morning. My co-host is Ed Chauncey, who's a, whose voice perhaps is more familiar than his face. It's such a, an inviting voice, Ed. It's um, very pleasant. It's, you know, it gives us all a sense of security in the morning to, uh, on our way in. Uh, in our automobiles <laughs> to have that radio on and to listen to that voice and he talks about the coffee and the <laughs> all those lovely right. little things. <laughs> We've been joined on the program uh, by Ed and Wendy King who uh, well, I asked them before they sat down how long Party Line has been on and you know it'll be 20 years in January which is which has to be you know one of the the long runs of, of all time because uh, things don't last that long in broadcasting oh. neither radio nor television. Wendy look at the monitor. Oh, oh, no. Oh, Ed and Wendy, they pulled a few surprises like that on me a little while ago. Oh, look at the picture of Wendy. I thought those had been burned long ago. Now, that is a real blackmail picture, isn't it? That was uh, in our library. They were asleep there, Ed. Oh, Ed King asleep at the typewriter. <laughs> Well, that is a surprise to see those pictures. There's a good picture of Ed and Wendy. I always That's very like nice. That very nice. That's a little more recent. Marie, you realize in the time that we have been on, the people have grown up, actually been born and grown up. Why do uh, uh, people uh, think about the, the earlier days of radio with um, uh, such a, an affection? Oh, Marie, don't you think it's because it called on something very special in us, our imagination. Radio reaches out, should reach out, and grab you and bring you in as the listener to be a partner. And you are expected to go along and help create as the story unfolds. It really is a, uh, not a spectator sport. It's a participating sport. And that's what makes it so very special. Uh, now, take Dracula's castle, for example. On the screen, you would see it, and it would be stone and mortar. On radio, well, as a listener, you create something scarier and much more terrifying than any set designer could possibly do. And we thought maybe this morning it would be fun if uh, we could exercise our imaginations and take them out and see what shape they're in. And so your producer, Mike Fields, has found some radio drama. Now, for those of you on radio, it's going to be very simple. You've got the original equipment. But for those of you watching on TV, 
uh, Mike's going to blank out the screen and you can project your own pictures there and exercise your imagination. It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Miss Carson, my name is Keene, and this is my partner, Mike Clancy. We'll continue our celebration of the 50th anniversary of KDK Radio in just a moment. Won't you string along with us and have brunch with the bunch? It's a show that we think is a dilly. So go home and tell your dentist what a Monday, March the tentest. It's so silly when you're having brunch with Billy. For your high noon hijinks, let's brunch with Bill. Thank you, Ed Shotzi, and welcome brunches to 45 Minutes the Hard Way. And there's a question I have to ask all, all three of you. Ed and Wendy King, Ed Shawnsing, especially since all three of you have been very successful in radio. Why did you never progress to television? Marie, please. I'll tell you I'll, one reason. I'll tell you one reason I didn't after a few It's so much work. I was watching what you go through. Uh, to begin with, how do you get up and look so nice every morning, Marie? You know, when you have to do something, it's amazing how it gets done. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do such a good but job. But have you never it. really wanted to, uh, to get involved in television? Well, I think what Wendy pointed out before about the exercise of the imagination, I think radio allows so much more creativity. I was thinking as you two were talking about the use of imagination. There was a fellow named Jack Holden in Chicago played the role of Tom Mix on the radio, had a big, deep bass voice. Jack Holden was a little fellow, he probably weighed about 120 pounds, he was five foot four. <laughs> Man who played Fu Manchu, a fellow named Arthur Hughes, was a gentleman about uh, 81 or 82 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, Marie, there was a girl in Chicago who uh, did a lot of work on radio. She played the Dragon Lady on Terry and the Pirate. She was Maggie on Maggie and Jigs. She used to do a character called June East that was sort of a takeoff on Mae West. And she did the voice of Eleanor Roosevelt on the March of Time. One woman played all those different parts. A girl named Agnes Moorhead. I think she's gone on to television. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> yes, yes, done very well. You, uh, you did want to tell us about another famous uh, graduate of KDK Radio, didn't you? Oh, yes. Um, I remember way back in the 30s. The word had gotten around. We were having a new man added to our staff. And... Um, of all things, he was a page boy in NBC in New York City. A page boy coming to KDK as an announcer, you know why. And when he came in, we were quite surprised and delighted for this fellow who came on the air for the first time as an announcer on KDK. He's gone on to uh, just the top. You've heard him, you've seen him on television. We think an awful lot of this a uh, member of our alumni here at KDK, Dave Garraway. We were all here together back in the early days, scrounging for pennies, and we really did back in the 30s. <laughs> well, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> Dave Garraway and Ed Shawnsey not too long ago, and Dave was last in town, and we had our pictures taken. And for you folks who are um, listening on the radio, they're showing some slides of us here on KDKA, and Perhaps there's one man who's not listening on the radio this morning. Maybe he's listening on the telephone. Hello, Dave Garraway. That is right. The old telephone still works. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Fine. And where are you? I'm in bed. Oh, <laughs> in bed? Are you in Hawaii or Alaska or I'm New York? Los Angeles, California. Los Angeles. We just uh, went after all night orgy, and I'm uh, going to bed now pretty soon. <laughs> well, it's uh, out here in California. Ten minutes to ten our time, Dave. What is it out there? Ten I don't minutes even to want to think. Ten <laughs> minutes to seven o'clock. Forty-eight. What are you doing out there, Dave? I'm working on a radio station. You remember radio? Yeah, we're pretty we're well acquainted with radio. We're fine out here. Dave, this I'm is playing Agnes Moorhead. <laughs> Dave? Yeah. This is Marie Torrey. Yeah, Marie. Hi. Hi there. Ed and Wendy King are with us, too, uh -huh. on the program this morning. Morning, Dave. You're a brave man. Morning. Morning. 
we're having a little celebration here, as you know, our 50th anniversary. And of course, Dave Garraway's name keeps popping up. I remember the 25th anniversary, and we didn't think we could make that. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, what, uh, what, what, are, what is the maybe one outstanding thing in your mind about uh, the time that you were on KDK Radio? Well, gee, there's so, really are so many. I could tell you much more about KDK Radio than I could do about 15 years at NBC, I think. No kidding. What, why is that? Well, I'm not sure why that is. The people who are so very real at KDKA. I could st sit here and lie here, as to be exact, and off 30 people who worked at the station. I doubt if I could do that for NBC. But uh, I think the best time I ever had was the, the time they sent me out to do my own show in a personal appearance. Um, you know, they had a public relations uh, bureau there, and if you had a show on the air, and I did, uh, you could take the show out and, and do it at a church or a, in a hall or a banquet and make some money there. I had a show called You Don't Say. Mm -hmm. I took it out to a little town near Pittsburgh, and the lady who was the promoter and I, we sat and waited for the audience to come. And the total number of people who came that night to see my program, You Don't Say, the total number was zero. <laughs> Not a single person. You know, I remember, Dave, the next you morning you're telling me about that, and you said, I, Ed, I sat there in the auditorium, and there was only one little lady there. And uh, it so turned out that she was the sponsor. Yeah. And uh, the benefit was for her benefit. And uh, Dave said, well, first I prayed that uh, somebody would come. And then he said, when nobody came, I began to pray that nobody would come. <laughs> uh, oh, my. Dave, Dave, do you remember the New Penn Nightclub where we used to broadcast? The Nixon, sure. No, what the, am I saying, the Nixon? No, the new pen, yeah, today, you have to wait until after election to say the Nixon. The, uh, <laughs> the new pen nightclub, where uh, we used to make $3 a broadcast for a half-hour broadcast over the network at oh, yeah. 1.30 in the morning. And I had five broadcasts a week, and they decided I was making too much money and would have to split it up with Dave Garraway. <laughs> so Dave Garraway and I had to split them up. Was <laughs> there a Nixon nightclub or a Nixon theater? Theater. Nick Theater. It was both, really, the theater and the nightclub. I didn't think I was off base there. No, you're right. <laughs> Dave, Dave, we can't tell you how, how nice it, it was to hear from you and to think that you interrupted your sleep to call us. We do appreciate it. Thank oh, you so very, very much. Well, much fun. And my Marie, yes. What, what, one question I you a little earlier before I got on. What do you mean, pro progress to television? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, maybe, time I should have, maybe I should have asked that at a time when uh, you were handling the Today Show, huh? Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Thank we used you. to try to get KFI out in the coast but, years ago. Mm -hmm. So congratulations, Dave. Thank you. We'll continue our celebration of KDK's 50th anniversary in just a moment. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Uh, you know, we want to, at some point, pay tribute to the, to the man who really was responsible for all of this, and that's Dr. Frank Conrad, who is the, the father of broadcasting. And, uh, Ed, you had something you wanted to say about him. Well, I wanted to say that genius is a very special word and perhaps has been debased by overuse. It, it really should be reserved for that handful of persons whose contributions have been monumental. And such a man was Dr. Frank Conrad. Dr. Frank Conrad, the doctorate was honorary and came much later in his career. Actually, he was a man of little schooling, but he had that individual flame within him that was bound to shine across the globe. He began before he was in his teens, Marie, in a workshop he'd assembled in the family cellar, uh, tinkering and reassembling his mother's vacuum sweeper and washing machine. When he was 14, he invented an arc light, and the glow from it enlightened him. And he knew now what he wanted to do with the rest of his life. He graduated from grade school and went to work for Westinghouse, inventing, tinkering with a welter of electronic toys. 
He was intrigued with the concept of sending voices by wireless, or as he called it, broadcasting. And the spark he generated went winging around the world, shrinking its dimensions and girdling it with unseen bonds. It's fitting this date we honor the memory of this genius, this founder and pioneer, the man whose idea is now our constant electronic companion. And from all of us, those who speak and those who listen, Dr. Conrad, thank you so very much. The real start of KDK was due to the fact that some of the department stores in Pittsburgh began to, uh, began to advertise radio sets, which would receive signals that, that came from my laboratory. Well, the, some of our company officials, including Mr. H.P. Davis, he saw those and thought, well, here, that, that looks like that's going to be a big, uh, a big commercial. Uh, and uh, so he said, now, we better do this out here on a good scale. This little one-horse thing you've got down to your house isn't enough. So uh, we had a station there, uh, K uh, licensed as KDK, that was put up for the, for the purpose of transmitting from uh, East Pittsburgh to some of our other factories. Successfully did that, so we converted that to a broadcasting station. Difficult problems that were a stoplight to others were to him only a green light. Of him it may be truly said that he didn't know it couldn't be done, so he did it. Well, I hope our viewers have enjoyed our celebration of KDK's 50th anniversary as much as I have this morning. I know Ed has. I know Ed and Wendy King have. And before them, Harold Arlen and Leo Rosenberg, who were in on the, the beginning of all of this. Thank you so very much for being with us this morning. Marie Torrey's wardrobe is by Linton. Forbes Avenue, Squirrel Hill. Our contact set is furnished by Kaufman's Pittsburgh. Floral arrangement created by Flowers by Salvi and Tom, 545 Liberty Avenue, downtown. Contact was presented via a 10-second videotape delay.